From Cambridge, Massachusetts, WHDH Radio News and Public Affairs presents the first of this season's Harvard Law School Forums. Tonight, we bring you recorded highlights of the address by Madame Ngo de New. And now to the moderator of tonight's forum, Mr. Henry J. Steiner. Who's the South China Sea, and to whose west lie the states of Laos and Cambodia? I shall sketch for you very, very briefly some of the bare bones facts which I probably can assume are familiar ground as background to our, our talks this evening. Uh, after the war and the retreat of the Japanese, we had a situation where the government then in power, that of Ho Chi Minh, turned progressively towards uh, communist guidance and support. The extensive war with France in its effort to retain the former colonial area finally ended with the tragedy of Dien Bien Phu and the Geneva Accords in 1954. At that time, pursuant to those accords, the country was divided into the present North Vietnam and South Vietnam at the 17th parallel. But since that time, the free elections promised in those accords never have taken place, and both parts of the country, and in particular South Vietnam, has been plagued by the continuing efforts on the part of the Communist North, aided substantially by Communist China, to absorb it into a unified Vietnam. The Viet Cong, the name given to the communist guerrilla warriors in South Vietnam, have proved a constant source of irritation, friction, and peril to the present government. That government is a government led by Ngo Dien Diem, President Diem, with uh, his government offices and the head of the government in Saigon, a country of approximately 16 million peoples of religious complexion, approximately 70% Buddhist, with roughly 2 million of Catholic uh, belief. The United States through this period has lent extensive support to the Vietnamese government in an effort to protect it against the Viet Cong guerrilla warfare from within and the Viet Ma communist regime to the north, involving somewhat in the neighborhood of $3 billion of foreign aid, and at the present troop commitments and the capacity of instructors and advisors in the neighborhood of 15,000 United States soldiers. The foreign policy complications are fairly evident. The concerns are fairly evident. Our speakers may draw this out in part in the evening. What role does our speaker play in this confused and delicate situation? Indeed, I could call this brief introduction, What is New in Vietnam? <laughs> our speaker, with a talent for the pungent phrase has made herself well known in the American press over the last few months, particularly in view of the recent events of religious friction, uh, Buddhist demonstration, and the terrifying self-immolation of monks of the Buddhist belief. The family to which Madame Nu is related is one that occupies extensive positions of power within South Vietnam. Uh, her husband is the head of a variety of public and secret organizations of considerable power and brother to President Diem. President Diem's other brothers, in turn, occupy positions of considerable importance in the administration of provincial areas and in the Catholic Church hierarchy within Vietnam. Her parents were, until their recent resignation, ambassador to the United States and advisor at the United Nations. With this very brief background and sketch, it is my pleasure to introduce you to this evening our speaker, Madame Nu. Ladies and gentlemen, at first I did not intend at all to repeat myself and each time I see a new audience I, I speak of new things, but uh, I have received so many letters of people who protest saying that why I have not said this and that 
while in fact I have already said them and it was not pu uh, published uh, enough. So once again, I think it is better for me to read the introduction that I have read at the Overseas Press Club, which is very short, uh, but which presents uh, which presents things uh, quite completely, at least what uh, which interests you the most. Uh, since the introduction is very short, uh, the session of questions and answers will be longer. I have come to this great country several times before and and have always met with friendship and sympathetic understanding. I did not therefore quite understand the warning given by some people that I should not come to the United States at this time when friendship and understanding are more essential than ever. So here I am, in spite of all the falsehoods and abuses inflicted upon my country or is it because of these abuses indeed i cannot bear to see injustice chiefly when it is directed against my country at the outset i wish to point out that i have never said that i have come here to re-educate americans rather i have come to learn a few things to place the true facts before you and to know how to make truth conquer, conquer fa falsehood, justice prevail over injustice and our friendship strengthened in spite of past misunderstandings. Moreover, it has been alleged that I have called your gallant soldiers who are helping us fight our common enemy little soldiers of fortune. My repudiation of those falsehoods unfortunately has not pub been published as widely as the presumptuous condemnations against those words. This has helped somehow to create a still stronger antagonism, antagonism against me just before my arrival here. And as such, it can only be seen as a premeditated campaign of slanders waged against me. Fortunately, lies have short legs, as the Italian saying goes. Concerning the expression, little soldiers of fortune, if ever made, it would be offensive only in the adjective little <clears throat> and not in the term itself. Indeed, according to Euro European usage, please see French Larousse Dictionary, which Sir Winston Churchill seems to approve because he applied, applied it to himself. A soldier of fortune means a self-made hero. Many more serious falsehoods, distortions, or blackouts stemming from recent events in my country make me wonder sometimes whether people outside of Vietnam know the real situation in my country. I should, therefore, like to present briefly the following facts. First, there is absolute religious freedom in Vietnam, in our constitution and in practice. You will, uh, wh whoever protests will, can do afterwards during the session of questions and answers. I shall answer. <laughs> Secondly, there is no discrimination against any religion. Thirdly, while religious flags are respected, the law requires as in the United States, that the national flag should have precedence on all public occasions. It is inadmissible, especially in a country at war, to allow anyone to use this 
as a source of pretext to create disorder under the cloth of defending religious liberty. Firstly, the few misguided men and women who were burned to death in recent weeks were all victims of incitement. A similar example can be found in India, where sati still occurs sometimes provoked by incitement, although it is against the law. I think that you all know here what is a sati, when a woman incited either by her own family, incited either or by the, uh, the family of her husband, or even by the public of the village, incites her to um, jump in the fire and to die with the corpse of the husband. Fifth, the communists have exploited this for political purposes because they know that they are fast losing the war in Vietnam and are desperate to use any means they can to discredit us, to sow dissension among the allies and delay the communist defeat. Fantasy sitters who take great care to shelter themselves in foreign countries while the fight goes on are now excited with the prospect of robbing easily others of the fruits of victory. These people speculating on the troubled situation thought they could get what they wanted without regard for the national interests which they have so far ignored. It is they who add fuel to the fire which has been created and fanned carefully by the communists. Sixth, in spite of all that opposition common to all countries, but which is criminal in Vietnam because it often turns into treason helped by foreign elements, Vietnam is winning her war against the international communism. Vietnam is indeed the only country which is actively fighting communism on the battlefield. In this, we are grateful for the material help and support we have received from you, our friends. But your moral aid and understanding of our problems and difficulties is of equal, if not greater, importance. Certain people may have, in their exuberance, seen only the sensational side of things and have created an exaggerated and alarming impression of the situation in Vietnam. This could only mislead the more people into making harmful evaluations and drawing unfair conclusions which may suit those exaggerations but surely not reality. It was therefore necessary for the Vietnamese to prick the balloon of falsehoods which the International Communist Propaganda Network and some misguided sections of the Western press inflated with glee. It was therefore necessary for us to tell the world what the real situation was and how bravely and successfully we are fighting our common enemy. Thus, facts have proven stronger than fiction. But that is no reason to condemn those who have pricked the balloon. Indeed, as I repeatedly say, to err is human, but to persevere is diabolical. It is with the object of understanding each other that I have made the first steps and come here today. A few of my reactions which have made headlines were due, I assure you, more to sorrow than anger, much less to cruelty, and not at all to publicity hunger. The proof of this is in my behavior with the press corps, behavior which has always been helpful as much as I can, but never, never demagogue. On the other hand, to say that I'm making an all-out propaganda tour is not true either, for I am satisfied to answer questions and only to people who wish to hear me. In fact, I have never wanted nor do I want now to enter into polemics or battle with you or any others who may have come here especially for that purpose. Indeed, I only wish to place the facts before you 
and request that truth be told and justice done. Thank you. The forum will proceed in classic fashion for those of you who know its past procedures. We shall hear first from each of our three panelists who will speak briefly and thereafter Madame New will have a chance to reply to questions put by the panelists. The panelists will put additional questions and then the floor will be opened for questions from the audience. Our first speaker will be Professor Roger Fisher of the Harvard Law School who teaches primarily in the area of international law and relations. Professor Fisher. Mr. Chairman, Madam New, ladies and gentlemen, we have just finished a short story reminding me of the lady or the tiger. If you recall that story, you'll remember that when the story is over, you don't know which it is. In her speeches to us here and elsewhere, she has tended to present her audience and her critics with two choices. Either we debate her on questions of fact, or we accept her facts and operate on those assumptions. Those of us aware, with a, aware of the difficulty of fact, we are likely to qualify our statement. We are likely to say that reporters in whose judgment we have great confidence give information tending to support the following conclusion. We are faced, and those who have tried such an approach are faced with a categorical statement that there is no religious persecution whatever in South Vietnam. We will say that a large number of people in the government of the United States and elsewhere are seriously concerned that the policies which the government of Mr. Jim are pursuing are a mistake and are losing support of people whose support is necessary to win the war. We are faced with a categorical statement of a leading citizen of the country saying that is not so. <clears throat> By putting a bold front on categorical statements, Madam New tends to win any public confrontation in circumstances of this kind. For myself, I reject both the alternatives which she has handed us. I choose not to debate her on questions of fact I choose not to accept her factual statements as being an accurate characterization of the situation in South Vietnam. Although she is here tonight, we have other witnesses. We have over months read the testimony of a large segment of the Western press. We have <coughs> seen the reports of our government officials. We have seen the conduct of the foreign minister of Vietnam who resigned in protest of the religious persecution, shaving his head as a Buddhist. We have the resignation of the ambassador of South Vietnam to the United States in protest of his government's policy of persecution. We've had the resignation of the Vietnamese advisor at the United Nations in protest of the government's policy. We have the all but unanimous view that in South Vietnam today, a family clique is ruling in dictatorial fashion suppressing criticism of the government, eliminating political opposition, and regarding the war as primarily one of keep, to keep them in power. Conclusions differ among us here in this country as to whether the situation is hopeless or whether it is still worth working with the government in power. No one, I repeat, no one that I've seen, no responsible voice, has given us a report comparable to the one we have just heard tonight. We are told that everyone else is misinformed, deceived, trying to save face, 
or worried about the American election. If we come to identifying biased witnesses, I find no witness more biased than Madame New here. Biased from her position, she is fighting for her very political life, and she is one of the leading, most important women in politics in the world today. <clears throat> there are better ways to consider the problem in South Vietnam than to debate disputed facts, better ways to deal with disputed facts. I am happy indeed that the government of South Vietnam is pursuing one of these by inviting the United Nations to send a group to study the Buddhist problem and the alleged repression of Buddhists in South Vietnam. That invitation had more effect on me than all the statements I've heard or read of our speaker this evening. I await their report with interest. I am convinced that the very fact of that commission means the situation will be better in the future than it has been in the past. Despite disagreement on facts, there seem some policy issues we can discuss. One I would like to refer to is the apparent assumption that as long as the government is against communists, that's all one need ask. But communism is bad not because it's called communism. It's bad because it suppresses freedom and because once such a government is established, there is a serious risk that it will be kept in power against the will of the people by aid from a foreign government. When we look at Vietnam today, we have to compare the alternatives. And to run, we are running a risk that we are helping keep a government in power against the majority of the will of the people, that we are keeping a government in power that may be suppressing freedom. I will not quarrel with her statement that the situation in South Vietnam is more favorable than would exist if the communists were in control. But that's not my standard of judgment of a country I wish to be identified with or support. I think we can ask more. I think we have our duty to use our influence to see that more is done. This leads to the second kind of policy question which seems to me involved without getting into the detailed facts. This is the problem of intervention. We have, I've read statements in the press that Madame New does not know what we want the government to do. There were some indirect hints given, but no one told her, no one has told the government what the United States wants. We've also had complaints that the United States has said far too much and has intervened in domestic situation. It is a difficult situation for both sides when we are paying approximately half or more of the budget of South Vietnam to work out the proper jurisdiction of whose problem belongs to whom and where our legitimate interests begin. In the law, we have the notion that even though a federal government can grant aid or withhold it, it may not impose certain conditions on that aid, the unconstitutional condition. I would suppose we will have to develop some comparable concept, if not a legal one, in the international arena. If the United States should condition its aid on an insistence that Madame New not speak in this country, I would regard that as outrageous. If the United States should condition its aid or insist that all aid would be cut off unless she said the right things or unless she dressed differently or a number of other matters, I would regard that as grossly improper, despite the fact that we are paying half the cost of running the country. On the other hand, when it comes to those measures which we deem necessary to get the support of the people, those measures of politics, such as arresting thousands of students, arresting large numbers of monks, when it comes to questions which we believe are undercutting the very purpose for which we're there, it seems we not only have a right but a duty to speak out, and not only speak out, but to use the pressure and influence which we have. If we should send soldiers and helicopters to fight the risk of a North Vietnam suppression of freedom, it seems to me we want to develop techniques for fighting the risk of a South Vietnam suppression. 
And this is a problem where we are, unfortunately, or fortunately, we are partners, but we have differences. I think it is valuable that Madam New comes to this country. I think I would doing, be doing her less than the courtesy she deserves without speaking as freely as I have the way she has spoken here. Thank you. panelist, Mrs. Suzanne Rudolph, has been a lecturer in the Department of Government at Harvard University since 1957. Her courses are primarily in the area of modern Indian history and government. Mrs. Rudolph. In some ways, I would find this a more cheerful occasion, if it were possible, for Madam New and myself to discuss the uh, very considerable contributions which she has made to what I think is usually referred to as female emancipation. Her legislation, which she piloted through, um, on concubinage and polygamy, I think are issues on which we could agree. <laughs> I would add that I think Madame New and I can agree on sati. But a further question arises as to whether we can agree uh, concerning the meaning of the kind of self-punishing protest um, which the Buddhist uh, self-immolations represent and which she's compared to sati. In some ways, I think this is a mistake because a honorable and old tradition of political protest in Asia is a little different from the self-immolation of wives and the funeral pyres of their husbands. Uh, in fact, it is true that throughout South and Southeast Asia, from Gandhi's fasts against the British Raj, through uh, traditional Brahmin self-immolation in protest against unjust taxation, through the Buddhist self-immolations, this particular technique of self-punishing has been a very important form of political protest, and it's not one to be dismissed lightly. Uh, the difficulty with the Buddhist use of it in South Vietnam is essentially this. It's a technique which depends on uh, the assumption that the rulers against whom it is directed have a conscience which will respond to the technique. This assumption was correct in the case of the British Raj. <laughs> Let me turn to one or two other problems. Um, which are of a more political sort, uh, or rather which touch more nearly on American policy, uh, with respect to Vietnam. We've recently been assured by the military team under Mr. McNamara's direction that by 1964 we can expect some kind of breakthrough uh, in what is called the South Vietnamese War. And this reassurance rests to a very large extent, on further assurances by General Harkins on the scene to the military mission. I think that it may be well for American policy to entertain some, skeptic, some, some skepticism concerning this estimate. In 1960, the head of the then MAG Commission in South Vietnam Military Advisory Group advised the Mansfield Committee that the military advisory group could be wound up in the most immediate future. At that time, I assume that uh, our military people um, had some reason for making such an estimate, but as the estimate that time was overly optimistic, I think we need to be a little skeptical about the more recent estimate. And we need indeed to ask a rather fundamental question of our South Vietnam policy. And that fundamental question is, can this war be won? We have 17,000 troops. 12,000 to 17,000 estimates seem to vary, um, uh, in South Vietnam to reassure us that that war can indeed be won. Uh, we find that in recent years, American policy 
with respect to guerrilla warfare has been formulated in such a way that um, uh, we are more directly in touch, uh, more directly coming to grips with the guerrilla techniques of warfare there involved. But to some extent, we have reassured ourselves on the basis that after 12 bitter years in Malaya, where a similar kind of dirty war went on, um, the war or the uh, contest was fought to some kind of successful conclusion. The Malaya analogy uh, has comforted us and perhaps unfortunately so. There are several fallacies in the picture. First of all, it, it seems that uh, there's a simple geographic difficulty here. Malaya, unlike Vietnam, uh, did not offer what some people have called an active sanctuary to the guerrillas. Uh, the South Vietnamese, Vietnamese guerrillas are perpetually in the position where they can indeed melt into the North Vietnamese border. And this is a condition which will not disappear. It is a condition which was not approximated in Malaya. And it is a condition which was not approximated in Malaya and which gives the North Vietnamese holding power that the Malayan guerrillas probably did not have. The strategic hamlet system, on which we've also rested many of our hopes, raises somewhat similar problems. Um, such strategic hamlets involve, the, in fact, the coercion. To some extent, the process is voluntary, and our military people have apparently tried to make it as humane a process as possible. Uh, the hamlet system rests on considerable coercion, and there's good reason to believe that the number of people who will be recruited to Viet Cong or to at least Viet Cong sentiments by this very security device needs to be balanced against any kind of security which the device itself can provide. In other words, our central military approach has itself problems for civilian support. Finally, the overall problem of national morale arises. Everyone knows that one of the fundamental conditions of guerrilla warfare is that there should be some kind of popular support in the country uh, for the regime in, uh, to uh, uh, prosecute the war uh, successfully. Uh, uh, Roger Fisher has already spoken on the subject of what the regime has done to alienate this kind of support, and I shall not go on any further. I think these are some of the considerations we must keep in mind when we assume the war can be won, uh, and when we consider whether there are a variety of alternatives which we should bear in mind as we consider our Vietnamese policy. Among the variety of possibilities and alternatives that we must bear in mind is, I think, one very important one. And that is that uh, we know that the North Vietnamese regime depends for food at the moment very heavily on the Chinese, both the political situation within the North Chinese Communist Party and North Vietnamese nationalism make this an undesirable situation and make many North Vietnamese feel they would like to establish trade relations uh, with the South. How solid this desire is, we don't know. Uh, French correspondents have reported it frequently. Uh, there is some suggestion that we have here a quid pro quo on which comes some kind of bargaining uh, could be pursued, where in return for trade relations, which would uh, give the North Vietnamese a food supply that would detach them from the Chinese in turn, in return for that they might conceivably uh, consider some kind of detente in the present guerrilla warfare. These are, I think, some of the things we must think about. Our final panelist is Professor Stanley Hoffman of the Harvard Government Department. Professor Hoffman teaches primarily in the field of international law and modern European history and government. I find that I have very little to say, in part because it has been said, what had to be said was said already by the two previous panelists, and in part because I came here with an open mind and wanted to see uh, what the issues were which Madame Nu would raise. And I find that there are no issues. Obviously, everything we have been reading about in recent months has been a fabrication. There is a war being fought and won, and everything which uh, disturbs the war effort is either a communist invention or some kind of misdeed committed by journalists. 
This simplifies the problem, but it simplifies it a little bit too much. And I would simply say a very few words about uh, the two main points which I have found in the presentation this evening. The first point uh, is what one might call a conspiracy a reading of recent history. Now there is nothing, there is nothing uh, impossible about the view that uh, the Buddhist riots and the riots of students and other forms of political discontent uh, have been either incited by the communists or exploited by the communists. This is possible, but we need evidence. And I do not believe that this evidence has been produced. In fact, the only kind of evidence we have seen in the newspapers or, or in radio and television seems to imply exactly the opposite. If the communists have exploited this discontent, it was only because it was so easy to exploit. But it was there. Now, there is always something very dangerous about conspiracy visions of history, which is that those who present them end up by believing them and by seeing absolutely everything in this light so that day becomes night and vice versa and at the end one finds oneself having lost a war by one's own political mistakes and still putting all the blames of one on one's enemies this is a familiar story it is for instance uh, the story of the french army in algeria it had been previously the story of the French army in Indochina. And it is too bad that it should be uh, the official story of the present-day Vietnamese government. Now there is a second uh, point which I think was perhaps not explicitly made, but which would have been made uh, if uh, uh, we had found in tonight's presentation uh, as much candor as there is bravery in Mrs. New's uh, effort to present her case. With more candor, one might have said, this is a government which fights a war. It takes those measures which are indispensable to the winning of it. One makes no omelets without breaking eggs. The trouble with it is that in the Vietnamese case, one doesn't see the omelet because the shells of the eggs are all over the place. <laughs> and this. This is simply no method for winning a war. We have the same enemy, we have the same uh, immediate objective at least, but we can differ about methods. It is perfectly true that a government at war cannot resort to pure democracy and tolerate absolute freedom, but there comes a point when the restrictions imposed on freedoms are such that the government defeats its own cause, and I am afraid that this is exactly what is happening at present uh, in Vietnam. Uh, if this were not the case, why would it be so difficult for political opposition to express itself? Why would it be so difficult for the president himself uh, to keep some of the promises he had made to the Buddhists in the early phases of the crisis? Uh, why is it necessary uh, to treat high school students and uh, university students the way they have been treated. Well, these are simply a few questions which I thought had to be raised. There is one sentence of Mrs. New's presentation with which I heartily agree. To err is human, to persevere is diabolical. panelists this evening have presented a variety of views in fairly accelerated tones, all to the uh, inconvenience of our speaker, who I'm afraid was not able, our principal speaker, who I'm afraid was not able to uh, grasp all the ideas expressed, as a result of which uh, I extend an apology on her behalf and offer Madame Nu now the opportunity to respond to those parts of the panelist speeches which she did understand.
I'm awfully sorry not to be able to follow all uh, all the all the uh, how do you call that questions. In fact, I believe that it will be a session of questions, answers, and I shall answer question uh, to each question. But I did not know that the, uh, tonight uh, I'm supposed to speak, but there are many people who speak with me, so um, I, I have only. Uh, I shall answer first to what I have understood, and if I have uh, forgotten something, please will you remind me. The first thing is this. I hear that uh, it is uh, sev uh, several times repeated that the, uh, the Buddhist is a majority of 70%. Uh, so far I have heard the 85%, sometimes it is 90%. Today. I am amazed that at half work you give only 70%. Uh, about this, I shall answer together with all the questions concerning the, that uh, so-called Buddhist affair. Uh, but before uh, going to it, I remember this also. I, I have the impression, I'm not sure, if, uh, if I'm wrong, please will you correct me. I have the impression to have heard one of the speakers speaking of three million dollars a day in Vietnam. Uh, so far, one million uh, and a half. Oh, I do not know uh, if I have heard well, but I wish to tell you about that one million and a half, which is more rep repeatedly said than three millions. Uh, about that one million and a half uh, dollars spent a day uh, in Vietnam. Uh, in fact, the greatest part is not so much spent only in Vietnam. It is spent uh, also, as I understand, for the Seventh Fleet, means for the Pacific means for all which uh, concern, concern the defense of Vietnam, of the area. Uh, I apologize about my English. I have learned English only during three months, eight years ago and in an Italian convent. It is the reason why there is trouble for me to understand. Um, about that money, I'm amazed that, that you, do, you do not seem to know more, but the greatest part of the, that money spent, uh, soi disant, in Vietnam, we have constantly requested that the personnel in Vietnam be reduced uh, because the, the American personnel as we say it in Vietnam, all Americans, wherever they go, they bring the house on their back like the turtles. So they, they do not live at all as us. Uh, they cannot live as uh, austerely as us. And this is a great expense. Um, <laughs> Last year already, to show that the situation has improved, we started to request the personnel to be reduced. It was indeed promised to us, but very quietly, it seems that 3,000 uh, more people were sent. Uh, so we and we were chiefly very amazed and puzzled because what which seems to us just a move, uh, just a gesture of um, good faith uh, showing, proving that your money is not, uh, is not wasted, that the move to reduce the personnel would be taken as uh, a progress of the war, of the situation, we were very amazed that that request from us was immediately besmirched in your press, chiefly in Washington Post, as uh, a position of anti-Americanism and a kind of American go-home. 
So we did not insist because of that campaign which started when we requested the reduction of the person personal. For um, the rest which is spent in Vietnam, much is spent for the war effort. And for it, uh, I must say that there are too many people who believe that the American aid arrives in Vietnam in big bags full of dollars and that the president of Vietnam gives to each of his brother every day um, what he likes. This is absolutely false. Your money is between your hands and you control it entirely. We don't have anything to do with it. We only, we, what, it, what is given to us is also under your own cont control. And for this, I wish you to remember that the Vietnamese people are very proud indeed. And it is because they are very proud that for two years already, they think they do their best to win this war, the sooner the better, and to re replace and to reduce the aid as much as they can. But we are really sad, sorry, to see that each move which want, well, um, well, we shan't want to show our good faith is always besmirched. And here I want you to know that um, we do not intend at all to drag on the aid indefinitely and that you know, when we, ac we accept, when we received, we accepted human, uh, the American human contribution in Vietnam, it is chiefly, though that human contribution is, on, is uh, symbolic, we, we accept it only to show to the world that the material aid we receive is not, do, it is not given to mercenaries. Because we wanted to show that with the Americans in Vietnam helping us to fight communism, we are in a common war, we, have, we are comrades in arms, and we are not at all mercenaries. I'm sorry, we all in Vietnam are sorry to see that in adding with the uh, um, um, material aid, there are still a few Americans who want to take that human contribution as a new condition for pressure against our country. And here I want to make it clear that already two, uh, last year, we wanted to reduce that just to please you, and never because we are uh, out of anti-Americanism. Now, for the... I have heard about lack of support, uh, that we are not winning the war, uh, that the government is only uh, anti-communist, anti and it's all. Um, that... Mm, for all this, in order not to waste too much of your time, I prefer just to say, uh, to say this. To say that the Vietnamese regime is not democratic and lacks, of pop lacks popular support is not true. Indeed, what regime, while undergoing a murderous war costing it during its blackest hours as many as 5,000 dead and endured for months, has held that during nine years of war, five elections on universal suffrage, allowing its people to choose their representatives. What regime, even in peacetime, allows its people not only to elect the parliament every four years, but also every two years, the administrative committees in countryside hamlets and in every quarter of each city, whether large or small? As for popular support, how would we have won if the people did not believe in their cause, 
if they d did not close the hamlet themselves to defend it against the invader. If taken all together, they did not mobilize themselves, accepting the greater sacrifices in this struggle against the communists and putting all their confidence in a regime which is leading them to victory. Finally, how would a regime without the popular support dare to arm all its people, the paramilitary forces who do not live in barracks but among the people are the proof of it. This is never said to you, but I am amazed that you do not know it, that our paramilitary forces live in the hamlets and defend the people. They, that means that each hamlet in Vietnam is armed. So if really the Vietnamese regime lacks a popular support, how it dares to, uh, to arm its people? I find extremely presumptuous the, those foreigners or those Vietnamese residing abroad, always in refuge on foreign soil, who believe themselves more patriotic than we, the frontline fighters. They ignore the decisions of the Vietnamese people manifested in free elections in order to decree that our executive lacks popular support and to complain at the same time in the most illogical manner imaginable that our legislature is no more than a rubber stamp for the executive. Would one, I ask myself, doubt, for example, the popular support enjoyed by the American government and for that reason seek to overthrow it because its margin of victory over the opposition was narrow? Would one also doubt the legitimacy of a parliament each time that it approves a bill presented by the executive? Here it must still be remembered that the war will not be able to be won militarily if it is not also won politically. And politically, Vietnam has a winning democratic program that it applies with courage and determination. About this, the communist tactics are very simple. They, keep, they know perfectly that we have a winning program to settle democracy in our country. They know perfectly that we do not intend at all to hide our shortcomings or to maintain our shortcomings under the cloak of anti-communism. They know it perfectly. They know that if we fight, it is exactly to settle democracy in our country. They do their best to hamper, to put handicaps in that movement. And after that, they use those handicaps as supposed so-called proofs telling that uh, we do not do anything for democracy. I think that such a trick should be known and that no, nobody could be, could be cheated, cheated by such a trick. Here, one of the speakers has said this. He does not accept my, my statements. And but put a, a name, a few witnesses. Among them, the foreign minister, Wu Wang Mao, my own father. If I wish to name witnesses, I may name much, many more for, about the witnesses who support the regime. But I think that if one rely on declarations of so-called prominent people, in that case, the list of prominent people who support the Vietnamese regime will, sh will is and, uh, without doubt much more important. It is said here that I, I, I say that who does not agree with me is misinformed or deceived or trying to save face or worried about the American election. Uh, if witnesses are biased, at, uh, if the, the most biased are surely I, are surely, uh, is surely myself. Um, it is said also that the only thing uh, which can, uh, I, I, shall, uh, I shall quote, there are better ways of dealing with disputed facts than debate.
And I'm pleased that the government of South... You have been listening to recorded highlights of the first of this season's Harvard Law School forums. The principal speaker this evening was Madame Ngo Dinh Nhu of South Vietnam. The guest panel included Professor Robert Fisher, Mrs. Suzanne Rudolph, and Professor Stanley Hoffman. The moderator was Mr. Henry J. Steiner. The Harvard Law School Forum has been a presentation of WHDH Radio News and Public Affairs.